thank you for coming today. Uh, we are here on Wednesday, March 3rd, uh, 2021. And this is a program that is coordinated between the Wayne Public Library and the William Patterson University um, to highlight the Living Jazz Archives that is located here in Wayne. And I'm very excited that we'll be able to find out more about it, um, especially since we're unable to um, we're unable to visit in person. So um, this is going to be a really great program. Let me give you some information about David Dempsey, and then I hand it over to his uh, knowledgeable hands here. So David Dempsey is a Wayne resident, so that's also a plus, and has been a professor of music, of the music and and the coordinator of the jazz studies at William Patterson University since 1992. He's also the curator of the newly established William Patterson University Living Jazz Archives, and it contains the archives of Clark Terry, Thad Jones, James Williams, and more. He's also equally active as a classical and jazz performer and has also performed the national anthem regularly for the NBA, New Jersey Nets, and numerous other minor league baseball teams. He wears, very many, uh, wears many hats, and is busy as an educator, an author, editor, and columnist. Winner of the New Jersey Jazz Educator of the Year and William Patterson Alumni Association Faculty Service Awards. He is a Selmer saxophone clinician and also a guest performer, lecturer, and conductor at over 90 universities, public schools, festivals, and music institutions. I don't know how you found the time to do all that in your, well, in your life. That was just last week. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am going to um, hand this over to you to show us in, about the Living Jazz Archives, and um, then we'll we'll um, ask any question, uh, address any questions and such. Um, so I'm going to pin your screen so that we can uh, see just okay. you and not have to look at me either. And um, give me a second to figure that out. Well, while you're while you're doing that, a special greeting to everybody, and in particular to Herman Sanchez, who's joining us from Mexico, one of our alumni, illustrious jazz alumni, who's now teaching in Mexico. So great to uh, be seeing you, Herman. Wow. He's actually just moved to Montreal, Canada. <laughs> so you're from my, uh, you're, you're joining us from Montreal now. Okay. Exactly. Yes. So, so, so there's not the time. I thought there was a time zone problem. So there really isn't. There's yeah. just a temperature problem. <laughs> Okay, it's all yours. Okay, well, thank you, Patty. Uh, you know, this is Dave Dempsey, part two. If you withstood uh, the first hour and a quarter with me, now you get to do it again. But this is something um, I can say that is a very special and even on many levels magical thing that has happened at William Patterson, right here in Wayne, right here on the William Patterson campus. And that is something called the Living Jazz Archives. And this started really a long, long time ago. It happened when Herman was a student here. It started when um, the, with actually the music of Thad Jones, who was a famous arranger. If you were here, whatever, was that just two weeks ago or three? Anyway, you probably know this name already. Thad was a legendary uh, arranger, band leader, cornetist, and he was our first ever jazz director in the late 70s, left here. This program is coming up on its 50th anniversary, one of the first five uh, jazz programs in the nation, and Thad was the first one here, left in 1978. So <clears throat> Thad's music is now being played every Monday night, well, under normal circumstances, when there were jazz clubs, and there will be again in the fall, uh, at the Village Vanguard in New York by a, 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 a big band called the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. And that is mostly Thad Jones's music. It's a lot of guys who Thad hired, people who are alumnus, alumni of Thad's band. And they came to us now 14 years ago and said, you know, Dempsey, we have a big problem, and William Patterson is the solution to it. And I said, well, you always want to hear that. What, what do you have in mind? And they said, the problem is that every Monday night, we are playing the same sheets of music that Thad 
handed out to us in 1966, and it's turning to sawdust. And it's literally, we have a new substitute come into the band, and they say, uh, what do I do at letter D? And they say, why, what's the problem? And he'll hold up the music, and there's a hole this big where letter D should have been. And that, that hole was you know, left in Denmark in 1974. So they said, we got to get this old stuff out of the books, and we want to retype it in, recast it, and have nice new paper. And we want William Patterson to be the repository for this, because this is the only place where Thad Jones ever taught. And that's the way we should do it. So for a while, we had you know, some boxes in the library, archival boxes, which you'll see in a few minutes. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we were, we were not making as good a use of it as we could have. And then uh, 12 years ago, two years after that, the legendary trumpeter and educator Clark Terry came to us and uh, dropped a bombshell. He was the master of uh, theater. Clark was, a great genius, one of the great and most influential trumpet players in jazz history, played with the Duke Ellington Orchestra, played with the Count Basie Orchestra, was on the Tonight Show uh, band for 10 years, was actually made uh, U.S. cultural history because he was the first African American on network TV every night, ever. Uh, a lot of people say it's Bill Cosby, whose name now cannot be mentioned anymore. It's a strange, all this turn of events. But if you ask Cosby, he'll go Clark. Clark was the guy who was there every night. And if you look at, uh, for maybe the, the age group that we have here, if you know about Doc Severinsen, Clark, in a way, was Doc before Doc was. And when Johnny Carson took the Tonight, the Tonight Show used to be in New York. Now it is again with, Jay, with uh, Jimmy Fallon. But it was in New York until 1970 or 72. And when Johnny Carson went to Burbank, went to the West Coast, Clark and a whole bunch of guys said, we can't make the move because we have too much work here. We have too much studio stuff, too much going on. So he quit the band and said, you know, this young guy playing third trumpet, the Severinsen guy is a real snappy dresser, great player, hilarious personality. He should be the band leader. And so he got the job. And so Doc Severinsen made history. And now, two hosts later, uh, for Hermann and your generation, you're talking about Jimmy Fallon and uh, The Roots. The Roots are right. the band for The Tonight Show. So if you want to put it this way, it's like Clark Terry in 1960 to 70 was Questlove. <laughs> we filled that, you know, where a funny joke got cracked and the camera pans over and there's Questlove like laughing and reacting. That was Clark. So he Clark made Perry a lot of a bitter laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he certainly does. And he might be funnier. <laughs> Clark is the, the, yeah. I mean, he's still, Clark should, could have had a whole career as a comedian if he hadn't been a genius trumpet player. You know, he would often, I heard him a hundred times say the lines, Miles Davis, one of my first students, he said, he was so thin when he was in public school, when he turned sideways, they'd mark him absent. And uh, he delivered that line and would just lay the audience out every time. And, it, you know, me too. I heard him say it over and over again, but his sense of timing and delivery was impeccable. And of course, that carried over into his music. David, I just want to inject, if you want to ever have another hat to wear, I think you should try for a comedian. Okay. You're doing a great job I, here. I do. I do stand up three nights a week in my <laughs> living room, but there's nobody there. So that's the problem. <laughs> Um, so after Clark came to us, now we weren't talking about a few archive boxes full of Thad Jones scores. We were talking about trumpets, awards, you know, a truckload of stuff. So we went to the then president and we said, Mr. President, we have to do this right. You know, we have to either do this and get a space for it 
or we have to say no to Clark Terry and I'll just jump in front of the next bus that comes down Hamburg Turnpike, but I would rather say no to Clark than to say, yeah, sure, Clark, and put his stuff in boxes in a closet. So he did. And so here we are, and this is a uh, college hall at William Patterson University. It's a thousand square foot space. And as I said, it's a miracle. And the, the ultimate miracle is that this is totally funded by donor, alumni, and donor funding. So, you know, William Patterson, as every university, is going through all sorts of serious budget stuff right now. But the archive is immune because we're not a line item. There's nothing to cut. It's all supported by, as they say on public TV, people like you. People who are jazz room regulars, don't, don't worry, this is not a solicitation talk, but uh, some of our alumni, etc. cetera. So um, maybe with your permission, let me go to a screen share and I'll just jump you through the sort of the history of the archive in photos. This is not, uh, as I was telling Patty, this is not a dreaded PowerPoint presentation with tons of bullet. Now, point 23, I want to talk. No, it doesn't go like that. So here go we ahead. go. Wish me luck. Permission granted. Thank you. Can you see that? Yes. OK, so now let me go to slideshow. No, let me go this way. That's a better way to do it. Is that better? Can you see all that? Perfect, yes. OK, the Living Jazz Archives. And by the way, before I leave, livingjazzarchives.org. Any of you, it's a William Patterson website, but we realized early on that, you know, this is an international thing. When you have Clark Terry, Michael Brecker, when you have all these great artists, some people might be wanting to access the archive that don't know William Patterson University. They don't know where we are or anything. So it has a separate website. So Living Jazz Archives, with an S, dot org. And if you go there, you can see not, unfortunately, we cannot put sheet music and recordings up because of the copyright. But uh, you can see all the lists of everything, photographs, everything. And as you see, the first archive was Thad Jones. Here's Thad in 1978 uh, giving, his, giving his doctoral speech at our commencement. Thad, again, the master of uh, theater. He was awarded an honorary doctorate here. And uh, he pulled a horn out from under his robe and said, I'd prefer to play my speech. Did they record it? No. Oh. So, so nobody knows what this sounded like, but it sure did look great. <laughs> and there's Thad teaching here at William Patterson in room 103 in Shea. Some of these people we're in touch with. Some of these, all the, you know, the hilarious thing is, do the numbers, all these people are 60 years old now. You know, Thad, by the way, sadly, we lost him in 1986, so I never met him, but uh, have heard the band many times. I heard the band with Thad, but he was such a, you know, six foot three bear of a guy. I was too intimidated to go introduce myself. While I was at Juilliard, I went and heard the band quite often, but this is uh, Thad Jones and Mel Lewis, their first publicity photo. I'm not sure who thought of the tuxedos, but it's a great photo. And it points to the fact that this band made history, racial history, because at that point in the mid 60s, of course, you still had the white bands and the black bands. Players did not, on, on the bandstand and after hours, they would get together African-American and white musicians would get together and jam all the time, but a record company would not sign an interracial band. They didn't think that American culture was ready. It's the same thing for Clark on The Tonight Show, Clark Terry. They didn't want to hire him because they felt that Americans didn't want to see an African-American face on a white TV show. Well, that was proved wrong and unethical and illegal and everything. So. So here's the initial publicity photo. Mel Lewis was a drummer. 
who came from the Stan Kenton band, and the point is when they put the band together, the band itself was interracial. It was half and half. So the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra made a lot of great recordings, jazz history in the process. Thad was also one of the great conductors. I have learned so much from watching Thad conduct. As you can see, he exuded joy. He had a way of inspiring the band. You know, they would walk through a brick wall for him as a conductor. He was an amazing leader. And towards the end of his life, after Count Basie died, he was a veteran of the Count Basie Orchestra as well, also Clark Terry. As a matter of fact, he, it's interesting the weird coincidental or not coincidental connections. When Clark Terry left the Count Basie Orchestra in 1956, the guy who replaced him was Thad. So who knew that these two guys would now be in this room together? That's so interesting. It's the, yeah, you just never, well, there are many coincidences like that, that who knows if they're coincidences or not. Here's Clark Terry with one of his famous Meerschaum pipes. <laughs> we have one in our collection. This particular pipe has vanished, but we have a, a number of his pipes in, a, in the archive collection. Clark with the Count Basie Orchestra. Look at that, the Strand Theater. I mean, it's a magnificent place in New York that no longer exists. Yeah. You know, there's Basie out in front of the band and Clark is right I got to get real close. He is right <laughs> there, I believe, in the trumpet section. Clark Terry rehearsing with the Duke Ellington, the legendary Duke Ellington band. That's Duke talking about a mistake in the part with one of the trombones, and the trumpet players are sitting there. Clark is the third from left. And this is, we have a lot of Clark sheet music. The original sheet music, you can see at the top right, it says when it was recorded and what studio and the date. So we have about 100, 120 pages of pencil manuscript from Clark, which is, you know, in, in scholarly land, this is called, uh, you know, uh, first person or original source. Patty knows all about this. And if you can get original source, you know, if you're wondering about this tune and what the correct version of this tune is, this is it. You know, this is the ultimate, like a baseball reference. When you go to the basement storage area at the Baseball Hall of Fame, they have boxfuls of autographed baseballs of every Hall of Famer, and the FBI is there on almost a monthly basis because they use those autographs to find forgeries. If you can imagine a, a box full of Babe Ruth autographed baseballs, that will cost you a couple of bucks. <laughs> so anyway, the, you know, we have many original source materials here, which is huge. We get contacted from all over the world to find out what is the correct version. So question yeah. about that manuscript, David, is that a, the trumpet line and that's in the key of C? No. In, let me look at this. No, in fact, this, I believe, is a trumpet part. In other words, this is a part that Clark would have had on his own music stand. And a lot of times, you know, these small, especially the small group recording sessions, they would finish the recording and say, yeah, okay, boys, let's all go out and have a little taste at the bar next door. And they would just leave the music on the stands and walk away <laughs> because the documentation of the music is on the tape. It's on record. They didn't think of this as being the documentation. But then another version would be released two years later that wasn't the same as that one. So you kind of want to go back and say, what was the original? In fact, you can see here that Clark false start. Clark had three lines done, and then he realized, no, 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 this is not the way we want it to be. This is not the melody I want. So we started over again. So it's, it's a, a great, real treasure. Yeah, it is. A, that's a, it's a treasure. James Williams, wonderful jazz pianist, member of Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers for 10 years and 12 record albums, um, played, um, at, was one of the house pianists at a club in New York called uh, Bradley's, which um, as a part of their lease, they had a no drummer rule at the club. 
So many of the gigs at Bradley's would be piano and bass, piano and saxophone, piano and voice. And James was one of the central people there. And so uh, he taped a lot of these. We have 1,200 recordings from James Williams with just a who's who of jazz history. And you can see them or hear them not only play the tunes, but then between the tunes. You know, Milt Hinton, one of these elder people, would say, hey, James, do you know this tune? And James would go, well, no, Milt, that's from 1853. I don't know that tune. And Milt would teach him the tune on the tape. So you really have this real mentorship process because that is how jazz education works. I mean, I think Herman will be the first to agree with that, that probably the most he got at William Patterson was not, you know, sitting in a class looking at notes. It was being with one of the faculty who has a whole history in this music, getting elbow to elbow with somebody who has lived this music. And James was our... Uh, coordinator for four years until he died at age 52 of cancer. So that was a, a sad exit here at William Patterson, but a joyous legacy. Here you see him interviewing great guitarist Pat Metheny. James was, he, he could get anybody anywhere. He had a wonderful way of being an entrepreneur and convincing people to do stuff. And so Pat you know, to, he doesn't take his guitar out of the case for less than $30,000, this guy. But he spent a day with us. We have, all, you know, a wonderful day there with, uh, with James. Great interviewer and, you know, a great moderator as well. This is James in the recording studio with his band. He, in the end, played with a number of our students, played with me. This band that was recording on this, I was a member of this band for several gigs toward the end of his life. Michael Brecker, legendary saxophonist, uh, won uh, 15 Grammy Awards. And not only was he a great jazz player who toured with you know, his own bands, but Herbie Hancock and uh, Chick Corea, who we just lost unexpectedly. But he also was a great soloist in the pop area, played uh, on uh, famous uh, singles by you know, Joni Mitchell, James Taylor, Carly Simon, uh, uh, trying to think of who else, uh, uh, Frank Zappa, Frank Sinatra, two Franks that you would never put together in the same sentence normally. Yeah, so Mike was, um, like for example, if you're of that vintage, the famous Paul Simon single, Still Crazy After All These Years, that's Mike on the saxophone solo. Dan Fogelberg, one of my favorite pop tunes ever is a thing Dan Fogelberg did called Same Old Lang Syne, about meeting an old classroom uh, school chum female on New Year's Eve, and then at the end, it always makes my hair stand on end. There's a saxophone that plays Old Lang Syne. That's Mike. So a lot of Mike's living during the 1970s was made in recording studios. This is, he was also a great photographer. He was an art major in school, virtuoso tenor saxophonist. But this is a rare self-portrait. I flipped, this was taken in a mirror. So I flipped it around so that it said Nikon instead of no, no, no keen. <laughs> but yeah, this is a young Mike. <clears throat> this is the Brecker Brothers, famous band that really, when jazz and rock and everything kind of merged and got electric in the 70s. The Breckers were part of the central part of that, and you will see that some of their background singers at this gig are Patty Austin and Luther Vandross, who these people themselves went on to have huge careers. The blonde kid on the right is Will Lee, who played in the David Letterman band for the whole run of the show. So these people have, you know, and by the way, I should introduce Mike's br brother to his right, is Randy Brecker. Uh, Mike died of leukemia in 2007. Can't believe he's been gone 14 years already. Randy is still, Randy uh, is Mike's older brother, but he's still very much around and is here. And it was actually Randy that kind of engineered the existence of this archive. Mike and I studied with the same saxophone teacher, 
Joe Allard, which will mean nothing to any of you, but a legendary sax teacher. And so that's how I met Mike. I met Mike in 77. And when you get a chance to meet somebody of that stature, you don't just say, oh, gee, that was a great coincidence. You keep calling and stay, go to gigs, keep, you know. So we got to be, I, if I dare say, friends and uh, confidants. We had daughters of the same age and uh, yeah. We were, he was six years older than me, but uh, yeah, it was uh, an amazing thing in my life to be his friend, and now I'm in this surreal responsibility of the archive. And you can see this is an example of, uh, there are uh, 22 of these boxes. Wow. And you can see the problem that we have. None of this stuff has been digitized yet. And when you digitize a cassette, you have to, work in real time. It's not like a CD or a DVD where you can just go drag, drop, and it's done. Right. You have to run each of these things last 90 minutes. And this is stuff from the 1970s. I mean, right here is just historic stuff from his the band he had with his brother, the Brecker brothers. And there are gig tapes, you know, you can see all in Germany. Mike was a keeper. So at the end of a gig, the sound man would say, hey, I got a tape, who wants it? And Mike would go, yo. So we had just hundreds of gig tapes, rehearsal tapes. So this is a major problem in my life that you're looking at right now, <laughs> you know, because they're all slowly, yeah. incrementally deteriorating. Yeah. So we have a grant application in, light a candle for us. What we're trying to do is bring somebody in who is a tape archivist for eight hours a day for a year. And then maybe they can make a dent in this. Because it's, you know, you take 1,200 times nine, 90 minutes, yeah. you know, that's a long time. Plus Clark Terry, plus James Williams, there's a lot of tapes. We also have hundreds of thousands of pages of Michael Brecker music. This is a famous tune that they recorded in the 70s with a great title some skunk funk and uh again this uh, amazingly has a clark terry connection randy who wrote this tune was in clark's band at the time and uh he went to clark's secretary's house to get paid and the secretary had a pet skunk which jumped up on she said sure just sit the secretary says yeah randy just sit there on the couch i'll be right back with the check this skunk jumps up on his lap you know and a normal person is going to be slightly taken aback by this and she goes oh that's you know that's harvey my pet skunk so he was writing this tune thus the title i'll write some funk in honor of this skunk it's going to be some skunk funk and this this is one of the most played performed re-recorded tunes of the 1970s and this by the way is original ink with i don't know if you look at the fourth line down if you're in, Come on, you can see this, or if anybody's a music musician. Fourth line down, third bar, you'll see a piece of white tape stuck over this. That's known in the time of handwriting music. It's known as goof tape. That's when you make a mistake that's so big that you can't erase it. It was tape that had a manuscript written on it, and you would just go, stick, start over again. <laughs> so there's actual goof tape on this original version of Skunk Funk. Wow. I'll pick up the pace here. We have Mike Brecker's practice and composition notebooks, which are mind-blowing. 800 pages of this. Herman's probably looking at this going, oh, can I take a shot of this? I want to practice. <laughs> it's all patterns that he came up with, and you hear you play the patterns and you say, oh, I've heard Mike play this stuff. You really get a chance to kind of get inside his brain. So it's, uh, we're still trying to figure out how to publish this because some pages have people's phone numbers on it that you can't give, you know, it's a, it's a real copyright editing problem. Would you ever digitize some of these things and maybe put a watermark on it so that People could access it as a virtual museum piece? Maybe. We're working with Mike's wife, who's been tremendous. Susan Brecker has been a tremendous uh, and generous partner here. And we're trying to figure out how to do this. But the thing is, so many people want this that she's hoping that she can publish some edited version of it. Right.
And now I'll pick it up to just one page per artist, the great art farmer. We just got this archive uh, thanks to the uh, generous donation that it was 16 boxes of material, hundreds of scores, photos, recordings. Art Farmer was in a group called the Jazz Tet with Benny Golson. He made a lot of history in jazz, and now we have all of his papers. It's so new that I have to confess I don't even quite know all of what we have yet. But thanks to the donors, a lot of this has been digitized, so our work has been done for us. Jim McNeely, you'll notice that this is the Jim McNeely collection. We, have, we call them collections because Jim is feeling just fine, thank you. <laughs> Every, everybody else that you have met already has sadly left the planet. Jim uh, just downsized, lived in uh, Maplewood for many years, taught here at William Patterson, was one of the, ran, run the, ran the uh, BMI Jazz Workshop in New York City. As you see, wrote for a lot of the European jazz orchestras, the Vanguard Jazz, and now he lives in Maine. And when he downsized, he said, Dave, I got a present for you. You know those big rubber tubs that you use? When yes. You play? Well, he had 37 boxes of those full <laughs> of scores. So I'll show you in a minute. I'll show you. We're still, they're all sorted, but the boxes, the archival boxes haven't come in yet. So we're still working with that. Jim McNeely, Don Sebesky, another legendary arranger. Uh, again, kind of downsized, lives in a senior living place, lives in New Jersey, but we have about 500 of his scores. And he recorded on the famed CTI label with people like George Benson, Chet Baker, Paul Desmond, whoops, and George Benson, whoops. I think I hurried through that a little bit. George is listed <laughs> twice, sorry. And also, uh, there are scores outside the realm of jazz for Barbara Streisand, Liza Minnelli, uh, about 90 arrangements for John Pizzarelli. And I don't think John knows that that stuff is here. So when he's on your series, you might mention, I will. so Don Sebesky did, oh my God, John did all, well, guess where all those charts are, John? <laughs> They're at your alma mater, your dad's, you know. And uh, I should say, I'm using the word scores. If you're not a musician, I, could, I should explain what a score is. We'll look at one in a second, but it's a large sheet of paper that has, like if it's a, if it's a 20 piece band, it has 20 lines on it and they're all moving simultaneously. So unlike a regular piece of music where you just go, duk, 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 you read it like you would a book, this, has lines that are all moving simultaneously, and the conductor watches this. It has everybody's part at once. So a big band score would have 16 parts, five saxes, four trumpets, four trombone in the rhythm section. An orchestral score has even more than that. And one of Don Sebesky's great geniuses is his, avail his ability to write orchestral music for jazz. So a lot of his music is big format stuff for orchestras and so That's we're incredible so, yeah we're so pleased to have that al regney this is uh, al is a colleague of mine i was in the american saxophone quartet for 12 years and uh, al uh, played with the new york philharmonic all the way back to bernstein Anytime you hear any saxophone recorded with the New York Philharmonic on any recording or broadcast, this is the guy that did it. And when we had multiple saxes with the Philharmonic, that was us for 12 years. So he brought all of us in, and now that he's semi-retired, living in Richmond, Virginia, he gave us all of his saxophone music. Rare, unpublished orchestral parts, because every time he would play with the Met or the Philharmonic or the National Symphony or tour with somebody, he would keep a copy of the music. And this stuff is not publicly available. So we have an amazing collection of orchestral music, etc. And we also have Ray Beckenstein's uh, collection, which is the New York Saxophone Quartet. So we also have a huge repository of saxophone music here, which, you know, the sax majors are in, in heaven because they have, you know, you, it would take you 150 years to play all this music. So there we have it. 
That is the. Uh, uh oh, I just killed my. What am I doing? Oh, there we go. <laughs> I disappeared for a moment. Let me uh, take you on a walk. Here comes the daring portion of this program. Ready? If I drop all of you on the floor, I'm so sorry. Now I have I have helmets to pass out now. I'm going to walk you around the the space, and you can see we have a a big uh, like a meeting table. We have classes and uh, seminars in here. All all the pictures on the wall, all come from these artists' offices and living rooms. So they're all original uh, materials from the artists. Here is uh, the glass, a glass case full of materials. This is uh, Clark Terry's uh, flugelhorn that he played for about 15 years. There's a whole uh, sort of a sub-collection here of magazine covers and record album covers with that horn on it. There's a famous, if you want to, uh, uh, I bet you didn't know there'd be any homework for this session, but if you go on YouTube and just click on Clark Terry Tonight Show, you will see Johnny, Car uh, Johnny Carson brought him back from time to time. And this was uh, giving him one award or another, and he comes out and just kills it for about 10 minutes playing with the band on that horn. So uh, that's uh, Clark's horn, not to go through every item, but this is a real rarity. That is uh, Clark Terry's first recording, 1947, and that is what's called a V-disc. And a V-disc, they were uh, not released publicly. They were actually V as in victory. They were released for the troops in World War II. So Clark made one of these V-discs, and um, it's very difficult to get them. And this one never made it back from Germany. We found it in a record store in Hamburg. So it's kind of like, you know, welcome home. It's probably been there in Germany since World War II. That's fantastic. Yeah, so we have then an entire collection here of this stuff. By the way, Clark Terry would have turned 100 in December. And another YouTube, if you want, you can go to William Patterson University, Clark Terry. We did a uh, birthday concert for him with the faculty. And it played this flugelhorn, played music from the archive. Everything was a direct relation from the archive to the concert stage. And by the way, I, I left out a big point when I was t originally talking about this. And that is that this archive is Clark Terry's own mission. Because when Clark came to us and sort of dropped this on us, I said, you know, Clark, why Wayne, New Jersey? Why did you choose us? Because I knew that places like the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, they'd been courting him for years. You know, he's an American icon. And uh, excuse me, my colleagues at the Library of Congress, but Clark's reply became the title of this place. He said, oh, all those places are for dead people. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, if you donate, and I don't know if you've ever visited the Smithsonian or Library of Congress, but you donate to that, and he said, my stuff's going to be stored at some warehouse in Landover, Maryland. And every year on my birthday, maybe they'll put that flugelhorn up. And then the next day, it'll be, you know, Judy Garland's red shoes from the Wizard of Oz. You know, I'll be lost. And he said, I want my stuff stored at the highest possible archival level. But I also want a copy to be on the music stands with the students. Because he said, we're not talking about me. He, he came to us when he was about 83, and he died at 94. So we spent, we spent 10 years working on this with Clark. And he said, we're not talking about me being old. He said, we're talking about 75 years from now when there's nobody around that knew who I was or anything. He said, what's my legacy? Because he said, you know, in jazz, now... You, we're starting to get to the point where Louis Armstrong is like that. Like in order to have heard Louis Armstrong live, you would yourself have to be at least 70. Right. So within a few years, there won't be anybody around that ever heard Louis Armstrong or ever met him. 
right now there are some of our elders still around that are like, I remember Pops. He was, you know, some of the jazz musicians will tell stories about him, but those guys are leaving. Right. So he said, what is my legacy? That's my legacy. And he said, I not only want my horn, and this is, this is his trumpet case. You can see you can't, you can't buy these anymore. Alligator skin. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so, this was a totally mildewed at Clark's house. So Clark and I went online and got the instructions. Clark loved this. We got the instructions how to get mildew off of alligator. And Clark <laughs> loved it because the first instruction is make sure the alligator is not alive. That's the important thing. <laughs> Clark loved, you know. So anyway, let's let's keep walking here. Past the, past the, uh, I can't get, uh-oh. Hold it. I just went blind. There, now I can see. I can't get it to turn in the right space, but you can uh, see all the awards, the different trumpets. A bunch of mutes now, there as well. Yes. Let's go into another room, and I can show you, this is kind of getting to the, if you will, the guts of the archive. And you can see this is all Clark Terry's materials. You can see the archive boxes. Uh, Checking to make sure that stand doesn't tip over. We don't want to see a man cry on Zoom here. That would be bad. I just want to interject that an archival box in a library sense is something that will help preserve the materials from being um, access uh, to dust or mites or right. any kind of molds or anything. So these are they're very expensive boxes to have, but integral to uh, maintaining any kind of archive. Yeah, and this itself is acid free, and you can see all the right. hardware is on the outside. And then you open it up, and each of the pieces in here are, they have, um, they're interleafed with archival paper. Right. So it's all, you know, you're kind of putting stuff in suspended animation, in a way. You know, Patty knows about this as a librarian. And in, in, interestingly, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this, Patty. When Clark gave this archive, you know, he said, you know, I'd much rather have a jazz musician do this and get trained in archive work. And I was, I had already played with Clark. I knew him. I was kind of jumped on the bandwagon here. He said, I'd rather do that than get somebody who's an archivist who doesn't know about jazz. Very perceptive on his part. So I went to the Library of Congress. I went to uh, my friends at, at Rutgers, the Jazz Institute. And interestingly, I also went to Cooperstown, ah. the Hall of Fame, because they are doing it, you know, underneath the Hall of Fame is this whole city of archival materials. And I said, you know, like, what are you doing? How do you protect Babe Ruth's material? Because, of course, they're storing wood bats, leather, newspaper, photos, they're storing everything. So they were a big help too. And I got to know the head research librarian there, et cetera. So you can see this is all, these are Clark Terry's books. And this is a perfect example of archive work in action. This is Clark's biography. Clark, the autobiography of Clark Terry, written with his wife, Gwen. And I am proud to say that I helped them finish this book because they sort of had, the last chapters ready and she would ask him questions and he said I don't want to talk about this stuff anymore but he wanted to talk to us about it so we would record him and transcribe it and this is the book itself you can see the thinness of it this is the original manuscript so you can see what wow. they had to cut to do the book we saved all the stuff and I remember saying uh you know, for months, I would say to Clark and Gwen, you have to give me those files so that we have the original manuscript. Oh, okay, we'll get to it. Well, sure enough, three months after we got the files, Gwen's computer died and they lost them all. So this is, we made digital versions of it. And so fortunately, all that stuff is saved. Here is uh, Michael Brecker's materials, wow. his record collection, all the music all the tape boxes and up on up here are uh what are called iwis 
which I can uh, take you out and show you just for 10 seconds here. Let's see if I can do this. Oh, by the way, this is Clark's other work. Can you see this? Yes, yeah. Freedom March Freedom Blues. March Blues. This, I believe, is going to be donated. It was originally with us, of course, and we're going to give it to the African American Museum in Washington because oh, they wonderful. want one of Clark's arc artifacts. And I said, you know, sure, they could have a trumpet or something, but anybody could have played that trumpet. But there's very few people that would have written this. And this is from, uh, it doesn't have a date on it, but I'll find it, 19, late 50s, early 60s. That's wonderful. And this, I was talking about what a score is. This is a score. This is one of Thad Jones' original pencil scores. And you can see all of the parts, starting from the top, the five saxophones, the four trumpets, four trombones. So this is what Thad would have been looking at when they recorded the piece. And the amazing thing is, you know, when a lot of people write these scores, there's all sorts of erasures and changes. With Thad, it just, boom, went. He had, I don't know, you ever saw the, the, the uh, movie Amadeus? Mm-hmm where, you know, Salieri comes in and he says, where's the requiem? Where's the music? And Mozart goes, you know, Thad, you have to understand the level of genius of these people, that he could hear that so clearly that it was all down. All he had to do was just go, and it just, it was one draft. There were no, he didn't use an eraser. That's incredible. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's like writing an entire play without ever changing a word. Wow. It's like uh, it's like a playwright being able to sit there in his mind and and close his eyes and watch two hours of play and then just say, OK, I'm going to write that down. It's scary to think about it. <laughs> God give it this, this beast. How can I get this right here? This is an EWI. It's an EWI, electronic wind instrument. And uh, Michael Brecker helped to invent this instrument. And it's, uh, if, you, if you play through, you can see that this is touch sensitive. And if you play through this, it measures your wind pressure. And it hooks into an amp and uh, yeah, it's a quite astounding instrument. And now we have all of them. He had three of them in his life. And we have them all, so we're trying to fire them up again. The problem, of course, is that they use technology through a computer that's now, you know, he passed in 2007. Right. So, uh, so we had to, the first thing we had to do is go find a 14-year-old Mac laptop, <laughs> you know. It's kind of funny. And then and a 14 year old programmer to help you uh, upgrade it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it, yeah, it, it would only run the the it would only run the material on that machine. Wow. This is more. This is all of Don Sebesky's material, all of Thad Jones material down there. And you can see this is the sorting of Jim McNeely's stuff. Wow. Everything is all alpha scores, parts. A scores parts B scores parts C. This is the contents of those 337 plastic boxes. So those archive boxes haven't come in yet. Right. <laughs> but I'm still working on it. This is all Jim's record collection. So as you can tell, you know, the students, the jazz students come over here and they're in heaven. I was wondering if you had a record player there. We do. Follow me. <laughs> This is so, so strange. Be able to listen to the LPs and such. Yeah, we have listening stations where we can go through these stations. We can go anything to digital. Wow. You know, and one of the nice things about this, it took us a minute to to find this uh, this uh, turntable because it goes. Um, it goes both forward and backward. In other words, it's a digital turntable so that you can, you know, make copies digitally right from it. But it also is uh, works at 78 RPMs. 
So it's hard to find both of those because, of course, uh, some of our uh, more veteran uh, listeners will know about 78s, you know, because jazz started with 78s. Yeah. And then in the 1950s, we went to 33 and a third LPs. It was a, store, a short stop off with 45s, but they realized that that was going to be a mess. And those kind of got relegated to, you know, 45 singles, pop singles. So now it's LP as in long play. But yeah, we had to have a, a, a turntable that would handle all of that. Now, is that only for digitizing or for listening as well? And listening you have a as well. And might I add, those two speakers, small but powerful. Those are great speakers. And a lot of our students, you know, they don't, they don't realize that there is a difference between LPs and CDs. And well, the analog play, digital argument, right? Well, well, you know, if, if the music was recorded since the CD changeover, then it, it's great. That was what it was recorded for. But um, a lot of the early music, you know, when you went to vinyl, when you were mastering it and actually stamping it in vinyl, you lose highs and you lose lows. In other words, you lose the cymbal and you lose doom, doom, the bass. Uh -huh. So what they would do is, as we call it, they would roll it up. They would boost the highs and the lows to make up for it. But then when they went to CDs, a lot of times they didn't take off the boost. So uh -huh. when you hear old music, whether it's orchestral music or jazz music, the cymbals sound too, they're like too distorted right. and the bass is too boomy because they didn't roll it back to flat again, or it was too late to. Sometimes the master tapes were made that way. You know, with everything boosted, you know, they would kind of compensate and you have to, when you're going to CD, you have to uncompensate because everything is uh, just... I'm sorry, know. I have a question for you, David. So no. in, in New York City, there's a museum of uh, television and broadcasting, which I visited where you're able to watch TV shows or watch um, archival materials yes. there. Now, since William Patterson obviously is a, a university and, and your archives is also as Clark Terry put it, it's a living archives for the students to utilize and then for it to be a teaching tool. How would you utilize it with the students? Would you play the record, show them scores? What, what do you do? Everything. I mean, we have, uh, we have classes meet here all the time. We have students working. We have uh, two students doing their senior projects over here with stuff related to the archive. We have one person working on his thesis master's thesis here and we have visitors all the time there's uh bill milkowski who's a very well-known jazz author wrote a lot of books wrote a uh, the the uh, jaco pastorius biography he has got the contract to write michael brecker's biography wow so as as uh bill said you know by the time i'm done you're going to have a chair with a brass plaque with my name on it here he spent a lot of time here and i send him stuff and uh so he's working, you know, photos, copy, everything. And there's a, a archivist who's in uh, Belgium who he connects and gives us more Michael Brecker stuff and we send it over there. We've had visitors here, uh, not of course so much since COVID because international travel is a whole different thing. But in the period just before that, we had visitors from Norway, group from Japan, uh, South America. I mean, people, you know, this is a worldwide thing here. Small, as I said, small but powerful. It's a small space. And William Patterson is a relatively small campus. It's not the University of Michigan with 50,000 students. But this entity here, and in terms of the legacy of these people, is huge. It's huge. And I'm, and, and incidentally, more archives being planned that I can't talk about but a couple more you know the momentum is building now with families saying oh wow they're really doing it right there they're protecting the legacy but at the same time they're getting the music to generations of young super talented students like wow. Herman, who are now going to go off and spend their career knowing more about it because i dare say that if Herman had not if people like him hadn't 
you know, not attended here, they might not know as much as they do about these people. You know, now, so you're the all... curator of the archives, so if someone wanted to donate something to you or you get collections, are you the person that evaluates and determines what will be added or, or not? Yeah, well, yeah, usually partly because of the size, but also the mission. The only way that we would take something is if it was the personal collection of that artist. Right. So in other words, all the time, we have people call up and say, you know, my uncle had 3,000 albums. <laughs> well, the only reason these albums are here is because they were owned right. by Clark Terry or owned by Michael Brecker. In other words, these albums are why, why did Clark Terry sound like Clark Terry? Because he listened to those records. Right. You know, they're part of his learning legacy. So now the students can plug right in and literally listen to the same materials as Clark did. So that, yeah, so I, I do analyze them and I am sort of the gatekeeper a bit, but um, usually if it's, a, if it's a big name person, somebody that's, you know, when uh, Don Sebesky comes to us or when Michael Brecker's family, th there's no decision to make, except <laughs> can we fit it? You know, do you have a, a, the ability to expand the physical space that you have in your archives right now? Nope. <laughs> but I, I, I hope that someday we have that problem. You will you may have noticed now you probably couldn't because the camera angle that one of the rooms here has shelving like a library out into the room. The other one is open. So we still have, you know, we can still put in a hundred at least a hundred feet of shelving in here that we don't have right. now. Now, so, Bruce, you know, uh, uh, we have one of our, our uh, participants is asking the question, do you have any idea if Bucky Pizzarelli's materials will be archived somewhere? And there's something I should probably pose to John. <laughs> well, I posed it to John and his brother <laughs> Martin and Ruth. We all yes. kind of talked about it, but then they both went so quickly that it, it has not been brought up since. But uh, where else would Bucky Pizzarelli's materials be? Yes, I William like Patterson University. The guy is, a, he exudes, he bleeds Patterson. You know, that guy is Patterson, New Jersey. And of course he taught here. So I'm not sure that there's any other place that they would put it unless they wanted to put it at the Smithsonian in Washington. And what my big concern, you know, I'm not ever competitive. You know, the, the, the jazz archive realm is there's too few of us to be competitive. I just hope that families have this as a priority. Right. Because there are equal um, numbers of stories. There was a famous saxophonist who died uh, a couple of years ago, who was a, a Thad Jones is from Detroit, that whole family is from Detroit. And he knew Thad as a kid and as a young player, and they used to have jam sessions. And the word was that he had a couple of boxes full of Thad Jones manuscripts, all got thrown out, uh. all got trashed, just sent to the recycling. Because nobody, right? you know, they, they just didn't know. And I'm sure if they had known we were here, they would have done it. But a lot of times you get, you know, the kids come in and say, yeah, dad was some saxophone player. I, I guess he was famous. You know, they don't know enough yeah. and they just come in and trash it. Did I, did I see online that you also have a collection of uh, Mulgrew Millers? Working on that. You know, sometimes Mulgrew passed in uh, 13. Right. And, um, uh, Sometimes, you know, he died of a stroke. He's my age. So there was, this had no business happening. And uh, sometimes it's just too painful. And yeah. his wife, you know, we, I, we were over there, we would go out to dinner together as families. As I said, we were close friends. I've had, I mean, I, this is personal stuff, but you know, I've talked to his wife. She has called me many times. We have to do this. We have to do this. But saying it and putting it in the car and saying goodbye is another thing. And so I think it's just not time yet. Yeah. But again, it, you know, he went to Memphis State 
but I don't think they have an archive there. He taught here for eight years. This would put it right close to where they lived. Right. He was a New York player. It makes all the sense to have it here, but we haven't done it yet. So That's I'm making my own little Mulgrew collection. I, I find a CD online or I'll, I'm sort of amassing things, but we don't have anything yet. Well, you would be the perfect caretaker for to, to treat his legacy with the, the care that it needs. Well, thank you. Thank so you. Herman has a question uh, he'd like to ask. Has any student finally ventured into writing their master's thesis related to Michael Brecker's study notes? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. That is, that's a scary topic because we're talking about 800 pages of decoding that have to be done. And, you know, one thing I would like to do is to try to index it. Yeah. You know, like this is all of the, I mean, excuse me, I'm going into music language here, but here are all the diminished scale patterns and here are all the pentatonic patterns and here are all the Coltrane transcriptions, just index them. You know, because right now the pages aren't even numbered. They're dated. Right. Mike dated them. He was amazingly organized, but they're not numbered. So, you know, and they've fortunately I have digitized those because I saw right away what right. an absolute gold mine they were. And I didn't want people going, oh, let's check this out. So they're kind of on on cold storage. You know, I take them out under special circumstances, but mostly they're we don't use them. We use the digital copies. So not yet. So Nobody's I presume done. that your archives is um, climate controlled and everything is yeah. in care in that way. Do you yeah. ever have any materials that you actually use the white uh, cotton gloves to utilize? We probably should, but we don't. But, you know, we do have a main, you know, you have to have your hands totally washed. No, every once in a while we'll have receptions in here. And I just lock down everything and you know yeah the the food and drink and the stuff don't ever mix but you know a lot of the stuff that's being used all the time has been digitized that's great helps. that means that you know these com there's also two super powerful mac computers over here that have just gigantic yeah. storage realms so that we have a lot of uh uh, audio storage. I mean, these LPs are meant to be played, so it's good when students are here to kind of, as they say, blow the dust out of the grooves every once in a while and play them. But we don't want to play them every day for yes, years yeah. because they're going to wear out. So I have another question. Um, do you know if Joe Mooney's papers are archived somewhere? As far as I know, no. There's another historic Patterson figure. I don't even know if they exist. Right. That's true. You know, Bucky, I do. Well, I, actually, I don't know how much there is because, you know, there are some players that are, you know, historic players that just weren't savers. Right. They weren't keepers. They just came home from the gig and like, wow, that was now on to on to the next one. They right. didn't save it. Fortunately for us, Clark and Mike Brecker and these arrangers, they were keepers, you know. Although there's mystery with it, like Thad Jones actually himself was not a keeper. Other people were. And there are still, you know, there's a famous Count Basie record called Chairman of the Board that Thad wrote four arrangements on that, and only one of them exists on paper. The other three are vanished. And the Basie Orchestra doesn't even have them. Wow. The Basie Orchestra had a no, we don't know if you're going to that story, but they had a, they used to store old music in a storage site and the storage site got looted. Uh, and I, it wasn't that somebody stole the music, they threw it out. Uh, so they lost a lot of historic music, including some of Thad stuff. So I've become sort of a Thad Jones ace detective. I found some original pieces in Europe band leaders that said, yeah, you know, Thad gave me that in 1962, right? That, that's not published. And I'd say, no, you have the only copy in the world, sir. So, you know, they'll, and, you know, we've been able to actually bring music back to the Basie Orchestra that they haven't seen. That's fantastic. Here, Basie Orchestra played here three years ago. And there were guys in the band who had been in the band since Thad was there. And uh, we, 
had a little ceremony on stage where we took some of Thad's arrangements from the archive, passed them out to the band, and there were guys who were crying on stage. One guy said, I've been with this band for 42 years and I know this chart like it's my heartbeat and I've never played it before. You know, and so we donated a copy to them. Ironic, we're giving back <laughs> Count Basie music right. to the Count Basie band. Yeah. Well, I think we um, need to wrap this up. I'm going to unpin you, so hopefully I'll be shown okay. um, um, with you. Um, hopefully everyone can see me see me as well. And I just want to um, add a couple things before we wrap up. Um, one is I forgot to introduce who I am. In my excitement in the beginning of introducing you, I forgot to ask you who I am. Um, I am Patty Slazak. I am the um, adult reference librarian, one of the adult reference librarians at the Wayne Public Library. I'm the uh, audiovisual librarian and in charge of the music, the uh, uh, mu movie and audiobook collections for the last 16 years. And um, uh, also a huge jazz fan and a daughter of a jazz musician. And, and this is where I have connected so well with you. I want to make sure everyone is aware too. Um, we had a program on the February 17th where we discussed the uh, Jazz Room series that is now available online on the library YouTube page. So if you just do a Google search and type in Wayne Public Library YouTube, it'll bring you right there and you'll see uh, David's wonderful smiling face. And it's a wonderful uh, about an hour and a half uh, program if you were unable to, um, to participate that day. I also want to make sure to give um, credence to the Jazz Room series um, all the information is online on their website at wp-presents.org, wp-presents.org. And coming up on uh, this Sunday, uh, March 7th, we've got Jonathan Blake's Pentad, who's going to be performing at 4 o'clock. On the 21st of March, we have John Fetchuk, uh, New York Sex uh, Sextet. Did I pronounce his name right? On uh, mm -hmm. April 25th is our guest bassist, um, our, I'm already appropriating uh, William Patterson, so. <laughs> Alice, <laughs> guess, that's right. <laughs> guest bassist Ron Naspo <laughs> with the William Patterson Latin Jazz Ensemble, directed by Chico Mendoza. On the 2nd of May is the Steve Lasmina Quartet, and Steve is uh, currently a teacher uh, at William Patterson. And on May 9th, uh, is it Houston or Houston? Houston, no, yeah, it's the it's the Texan pronunciation, yeah, not the Houston New York pronunciation. Yeah, and Bill Charlap, and Bill Charlap is the co-coordinator of the Jazz Room series with you. Um, so um, it's the best and, deal in town, as I will always say. And if I if I might add too that these are not only available on the dates that Patty mentioned, but they're also on demand. So, for example, that Valentine's concert with Marion Cowings was fantastic, really great and a wonderful rhythm section. And he, you know, he's not young and he brought so much energy to that. And that's now going to be available for the next month. That's wonderful. So all of these will be Jonathan Blake's concert uh, this Sunday, which by the way, we've already recorded it. We just recorded it. Everything is streamed and uh, that will be on demand. Just another note that by this summer, we are hoping to go both live and live stream you know because the beautiful thing about shea auditorium is it's a thousand seats so you bring 200 people in there you can be safe yes. especially as yeah. people get vaccinated etc well so. the interesting thing i think we've seen with the pandemic and we touched on a little bit uh when we last spoke was the fact that this model that has been created in a virtual world you can see any performer anywhere now at any time from the comfort of your home. And it's in many ways, it's been a real boon for some musicians um, that they've been able to connect um, with yes. their, their fans literally around the world all in one time. I mean, it's, it really is a remarkable thing. So I'm going to encourage everyone to sign up. The, the ticket prices are, are beyond re reasonable. They're, they're downright cheap and, and I think uh, uh, pay more to support that program because we're so fortunate not only to have the program to be able to access it, but here it is right in Wayne. Um, and we're so fortunate that when we can finally go, we're not paying for tunnels or, or bridges or parking or drink, uh, you know, um, 
the requirements you have when you go to a jazz club. I mean, we're so fortunate to have this right in our backyard. So um, please, everybody Thank sign you. up for that. Anything else about the jazz archives you'd like to add in? Well, to just add that uh, once we get back normal, open invite, you know, I'm under normal conditions. I'm uh, on duty here two afternoons a week. Right now, it's only by invitation and appointment. But once we hopefully get to next fall, open invite. You can come see this for yourself. So the archives right is available um, by appointment, though, correct? Yes. Once, once everything is open again? Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So we, can, we can work this out. So you can come see things. We'll do a little listening. It's fun. It's, it's quite the treasure my, trove you have there. My biggest problem here is getting any work done. Because I get over here and I get into something and all of a sudden two hours are gone. You know, I completely yeah. understand. <laughs> I'm studying with these great musicians as well as our students. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time again to meet with us. This has been absolutely fascinating. I'm so excited again for your program, for your archives, the development of it. And um, perhaps as, as time goes on, we'll be able to continue doing these uh, programs between the two of us. Thank you. I'll be there.